Hi, everybody. That was fun, wasn't it? That was a pretty interesting. Uh, I usually think Skype going to be disappointing, but I'm always pleasantly surprised. Um, let me just start out. Thank you all very much for joining us. We're going to have, let's make this sort of, I don't have any coffee, folks, which I need, but let's make this kind of a coffee chat type uh, thing. I'm, I'm interested in how our views of public health and what the community is, has evolved over time. And, you know, right now it can mean everything, as we, as we were hearing in both the sessions earlier, you know, food, public safety, uh, which is very much in the news, walkability, green space. And I see a lot of cities around the world in Doha, in Abu Dhabi, and mm -hmm. places, you know, new cities coming up in China, looking at how to get the equation right. And I often wonder whether our infrastructure, what we've already inherited, as this, as this lady in the back was saying with, you know, buildings, is something that if we were to just start from ground zero, we'd do a better job. So I'm, I'm interested, I'm going to talk to Ken for just to open up. If you could basically wreck Washington, D.C. and start over, what would you do? Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think you'd start with the underlying premise of, you know, what really determines the health of a population. And I think in this country, we've really focused just solely on health care and access to health insurance, which is important. But if you look at the data, Three quarters of the underlying health of a community is due to behavioral issues, environmental issues, and social issues. Mm -hmm. So I would basically look at investments that would have the biggest impact on communities. So we released a study that looked at those, and they are issues around social spending, parks and recreation, uh, green space, uh, public welfare spending, uh, issues around health behavior, both smoking, uh, exercise, and obesity. Uh, in this country, as I mentioned, three-quarters of the spending is linked to those issues. But if you look at how much we spend on prevention and public health, it's only about 3% of our health care dollar. Mm -hmm. So we have a dramatic mismatch in terms of what ultimately affects the health of a population and where we're making so investments. How do you get the equilibrium and all of that right? Because it seems to me that the criticism that some people might have is that sounds very much like a nanny state you know, over your shoulder advising, here's what you do here, here's what you do here, here's the program you need. And it kind of removes from that individual, you know, responsibility to taking a response. So I'm just wondering, how do you get the equilibrium right in, in the sort of political world we're in today? Well, I, I think if you don't have uh, access to those things, right. you're not going to use it. And I, and I think if you uh, look at people who have access to programs like the Diabetes Prevention Program, Parks and Recreation uh, uh, Spending, uh, green space, walking paths, the people use it. Not everybody's going to use it, but if you don't have it there available, then obviously people don't use it. So um, I would start with the premise that um, if we're really going to improve the quality of care and health of the population, the toolkit is much, much broader than just focusing on health care. And I, I would like to have a discussion not on health care reform, but on health reform, right. which really brings in this broader basket of, of goods and services which, which, that really affect. Which gets me to Carol, because Carol has been out there working with communities. Carol's with WalkWorks, and uh, I jogged in Chestertown, Maryland, across a sort of two-mile stretch of thing. I'm sure you're responsible for it, so thank you for the little <laughs> rails to trails thing uh, uh, I think you must have put together. But um, again, uh, take us down the path, excuse the pun, uh, of, of WalkWorks, and why that particular needle in the haystack is the right one to pull? So I, I do think that WalkWorks is a response to what Ken was saying, because what we do is we, we are in 14 counties in Pennsylvania. We so have, you're not responsible for Chestertown, Maryland. I'm not. Maryland. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, right. Steve, but we're not. We're only in Pennsylvania. Um, and we, what we do is through, this is a collaboration, as Emily said, between the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the University of Pittsburgh as well as community-based partners throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. We ask those partners to create one to two mile walking routes in their communities, and they engage the community in identifying those routes. Mm -hmm. Those routes are in the built environment. They are, um, we try to make them accessible. We, there are points of interest along each of those routes. We do make sure that there is parking for the individuals who walk the routes, but mm -hmm. because not everybody, we're generally in rural areas, more rural than urban. So, you know, not all of these, like the mayor was saying, not all of our routes have sidewalks, but we generally ask that they do have sidewalks. Um, 
But the next step in, after identifying those routes is engaging walking groups. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're really seeing people come together. Um, I can, we, we have great stories. There's a What's woman the age participation? Go back to this question okay. about um, walking in age. Because when I go see these pathways, I usually either see young runners or, or more aged walkers. So we have school, we have programs with schools whereby we have young children walking. Um, right. We had a principal take his entire school out to walk one of our route, routes, come back, bring people into the auditorium, and talk about physical activity as a result. We also have a senior center, they call themselves, that we have a group walking from that senior center. Right. They call them the, the white-haired walking group. And they're walking. So we do have all ages walking our Have route. you been able to get look at any data to see how many people you've drawn in that weren't doing this before? Or are they just doing what they were doing before now under you? I mean, are they wearing your flag and making you feel good, but in fact you haven't moved the needle at all? So it's a little bit too early to say whether, we're, but I do think that we've engaged many more people than, we have more people walking than were walking. Hmm. We also are increase, increasing the intensity and the length of walking. So people who may have walked fewer times a week or not quite as far are walking more frequently and greater distances. Yes, I, want to, I go to Pitt. So this is in Pittsburgh area? So, no, so there's some hills around Pittsburgh, so, yeah. There are there's there, some big hills. <laughs> there are a lot of hills in Pittsburgh, but we're throughout Pennsylvania. Oh, that's great. Well, you're gonna have to show me the map. Um, Sheriff Kincaid, you, you uh, when you came into to Fairfax County, which is very, very close to us, you just said this is messed up, right? Is that, is that am, I, am I getting that right? You're getting that right. That was yeah, um, so, about 29 and a half years ago. Okay, so but you came in and, and, and particularly right. with, with prisoners, when you looked in, in who you were holding, that I understand the staggering statistic that 40% had mental health challenges. What did you do? So of that 40%, at least one half of that 40%, has a serious mental illness, so schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or uh, major, severe major depression. So um, what we did was we, um, my staff was sent to different facilities throughout uh, Virginia mm. to get the state certified um, mandated training, crisis intervention team training, and we brought that back to um, Fairfax. We implemented our own crisis intervention team training. Um, we've had crisis training since I've been in law enforcement, but this is something that's much more intense. It's a week-long um, block of training, and it, um, it opens up a lot of eyes to those that may be cynical in, in law enforcement and um, in terms of how we treat those that are mentally ill. Speed that up, about two months later, this would be um, the spring of 2015, and um, I took a group down to Bear County in San Antonio, Texas, where they have the model um, program in dealing with those that are mentally ill, as well as those that have... Um, San Antonio does. San Antonio, mm -hmm. they sure do, and they do have a model system, um, again, not only with those that um, have mental illness, but also substance abuse disorders, and even those that are homeless. And um, it's all about, and I've, I've heard before, about so, I mean, I, I, we, What I like about this is that we're talking about total health. You know, we've got, you know, we've got, you know, walking and we have, you know, health in its biggest sense. We're going to get to Georgia's in a minute. And you're, you're looking at mental health. And brought, but, but so many people with mental health challenges end up in the jails and prisons. That's right. Why do you think that is? Because it's easy. That's why. And... Um, you know, the jails so and prisons you... have become the, you know, the default yeah. um, in terms of warehousing those that are mentally ill. And we were not, the, you know, jails and prisons were not designed to be psychiatric hospitals. So because it's too easy, that's why um, this has occurred. Let me just put you in charge of everything. What would you Perfect. do? Uh, <laughs> what would I do? How would you... How would you um, I'm really interested in this question of mental health and how the, the prison system is looked at as the way to sort of shelve a lot of folks that are, that are um, 
having trouble, but maybe uncomfortable with society. So would you, do you think the thing is to sort of staffing up mental health centers? I mean, what are the preceding steps? Because you've created a program called Diversion First, mm -hmm. and I want to highlight Diversion First and have right. you tell it what it is. But, but let's, do diversion, let's do diversion before diversion first. What would you do if you were able to kind of reorganize the assets of society you think is missing that would help law enforcement, that would help the people you're picking up, mm -hmm. et cetera? Maybe I'd run for president because I could oh. probably get a lot more done when, in terms of mental, mental uh, health. But it starts out by um, <coughs> our legislators, and again, let's go back to policy. Right. In creating policy that, again, it shouldn't be just left up to one particular um, population, mm -hmm. law enforcement, to you know, become the psychologists, the, um, um, the caretakers, mm -hmm. et cetera. But what, it, what we need is we need uh, the resources, we need um, policies, laws, and we also need to have, you know, I hate to say buy-in, but <coughs> until it becomes a priority, and in most cases, sometimes things are driven by, you know, tragedies, we have to stop allowing that to happen. And I think when people realize that not only is it the right thing to do by diverting those that are mentally ill into treatment, mm -hmm. as opposed to continuing to um, 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 put them into jails and prisons, you get a much better outcome, not only because, again, it's the right thing to do for the individual, but also for the community and keeping the community safe, keeping the community healthy. And the cost benefits are, are stunning. I mean, it's just millions and millions of dollars can be saved by doing what's right. You know, we've seen, uh, I want to, George has written uh, quite passionately about how violence is, also needs to be put into the calculation into the assessment of what whether a community what community health really is and how to get to whole community and you've been I haven't figured out how you've gotten to be be less violent but I mean I just want to put it on the table we've seen a lot of video lately mm -hmm. um, you know a guy was shot who was trying to help someone uh, with a mental disorder we had a uh, I don't know. I, th I, I just was watching the video last night, but uh, uh, the, the case recently with the, the wife saying he has TBI or something, had just taken medication. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put that on the table. This is something very much top of mind in the nation. Mm -hmm. And we're increasingly seeing videos where officers seem to be unaware or uninterested, some, mm -hmm. in the mental cal and, and, and they, they, in these cases that we've seen, some have taken action there. What do you think it's going to take to sort of overhaul that system so that a mental health sensitivity is first and foremost at, at the front end? I want to ask you and then ask George. Um, well, I'm telling you what it's going to take. Yeah. What, what we're currently doing, and that is with the training, with the crisis intervention team training, but it's also changing the attitude um, and the, um, of the culture um, through awareness, through, um, again, making sure that people understand it and they know it because if we're talking about someone who has cancer, mm -hmm. I don't think we'd be in the same you know, realm of right. this discussion because you can, you can see somebody physically, but when you look at, you know, we can look out in the audience and you, know, you can't tell if somebody has um, or is mentally mm -hmm. ill, um, but it's gonna definitely take a lot um, again. And when you have one group that's primarily being responsible I think that the accountability mm -hmm. goes way beyond law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, we're not, you know, we're not the um, designed. That's, That's not how we train. You know, it's, it's interesting. You just interviewed a sheriff who just um, walked across sectors mm -hmm. and absolutely demonstrated what we're talking about. The idea, if you're going to have healthy communities, you have to do things multidisciplinary across sectors where her second job is health care. Mm. And health, really, not health care. You're right, Ken. It's health. And so if we're going to make this happen, we've got to do a lot more of this across sectors where we, we look at health as um, something that involves actors outside the health care system, outside the doctor's office, mm -hmm. and redesign the society uh, in ways and put our dollars mm -hmm. behind the kind of diversion program she's talking about. What you get from that is... Um, the right people in the right place, getting the right treatment, and maybe, if we're really lucky and do this right, less crime, less violence, um, and maybe less injury. Let me ask you, I mean, press you for a minute. I mean, you're, you're an old friend of mine, and I've loved, you know, uh, Georges has published a wonderful collection of really political cartoons around healthcare debate and community health and all this, and I, and I love it. And you're, you're part of the marketing side of, of, of thinking about how to build literacy. What I find um, 
frustrating in the role that I have occasionally to confront these issues right. is that that program you have is such a unique, sounds like an anomalous program. That, 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 and so I'm interested in what does it take to either build the literacy and awareness that that should become a normal thing? Like, like we're talking, we're highlighting this because it's so unusual sounding, right? So how do you make the sheriff and what she's doing very ordinary? Well, there are other programs like that, but they've not had the breakout moment that I they need. I got to just interrupt. I interviewed the head of the woman who runs the Cook County Jail in Illinois, yeah. who I think is the only mental health professional in the United States running, uh, who has background with that running a, a, a jail facility. And that, again, I, I asked her, what does it take to get more of you? And it's a very unusual. So I just want to, like, yeah. you know, yeah make her feel very special today, but hoping it doesn't last long. Because, you know, so I want to just say, I, there may be other programs out there, but they're not a lot. I mean, I've, we've done a lot of programs in this. These That's are right. always unusual. That's right. And, 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 but if we really want to make a difference, it's going to require the leadership to say, to evaluate this program, show where it works. Um, and you can't just pick it up and move into every community. Mm -hmm. But you can take that model and you can do that. You know, we've done drug courts. Right. Um, so why not when someone is adjudicated to have a mental mm -hmm. illness and has done something um, which brought them in line with the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. why not have defined diversion programs to get them to the right place? Right. And Ken and Carol, let me ask you, when you're in this, in this realm and you hear these pieces, this is a little bit more on the extreme yeah. side, but you're, you're at an earlier, hopefully friendlier, nicer start. But what, when you think about total health, how do you encompass the sides where you've got lawbreakers, you've got violence, you have these challenges? What, what, do you, what do your experiences, insight, come into sort of building literacy on this uh, more problematic front? Well, I think a couple of things. One, it, we just heard the recognition of it, but I think what's going to be important going forward is that we have all these silo-based programs mm -hmm. that exist. They're community-based programs or some healthcare programs, and we need to find a way to integrate uh, these programs that are best practice, that, uh, that integrate some of the mental, um, medical services with these broader range of social services. And starting with the communities to make these uh, services available, whether they're through mm -hmm. recognition, walking paths, uh, parks and recreation, and so on. But then, you know... And you've shown that these make a statistical difference. They make a statistical difference. And the thing is that we need to find ways to integrate what we do in the healthcare side and I was excited to see that Aetna's uh, part of this, uh, that we need to give these health plans flexibility to have these services available as part of the way of engaging patients, doing prevention, managing patients that have behavioral disorders, because most of the solutions uh, are going to include a lot of the things we've just heard that are really outside of the healthcare realm. So we need some organizing entity that integrates all these uh, services, and certainly I think uh, health plans could be a part of that, but we need to give them the flexibility and encouragement to, to build these into what they do in terms of preventing disease and, and managing patients. But it, I think it starts with communities and, and having the recognition that these things make a difference. Carol? So I, I said in the green room that, in my mind, it's all about policy. Because, and there is, I've written about a, a concept paper, a policy brief on health in all policies. And it's a matter of bringing all of these different disciplines together and incorporating health. Bringing health to the table, you know, when the sheriff is making policy. <coughs> Urban planners, transportation engineers. Um, we have, I have two county commissioners right now, county commissions, considering resolutions to adopt health in all policies, the concept of health in all policies, so in the future, when they, resolve, when they go to address any kind of policy, they consider health as well as whatever the issue is. Is there a way to make it easier? And I don't, I'm going to ask a question. I don't mean to be facetious or silly, but I, I, uh, I have another house that I um, stay in, and, and every night, tons of people were walking by the house. Lots of, every night, the people come by, stop by outside the house. And it turns out somebody had made my house a Pokemon Go site. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is actually true. We have the founder of Pokemon Go coming on, on uh, Wednesday to speak at Washington Ideas Forum. I'm planning to ask about this. But the number of people, young but also old, who are into Pokemon Go, I, which I, I, I didn't know. They were, you know, when we come back to your question, I, Chestertown, Maryland is an interesting spot, but people come by and, and 
they, they uh, uh, bring out their phone. I haven't done it yet, so I don't know what spawns out of my house. But, but for those of you who know Pokemon Go, but it is a phenomenon that's incredible when you look at how people are out walking. and how. So I'm just interested in whether or not sometimes there are these bank shot weird things that, that have you know, net positive effects that we need to, because what you just described to me is really, really hard. Engineers, designers, this, that, meetings, budgets, <coughs> policy. I mean, the complexity. Are there easier silver bullets like web apps? Carol? <laughs> so we, we do not. Maybe Walkworks, you need Pokemon, Pokemon Go sites out in rural <laughs> you know, Pennsylvania. Walkworks does not currently have an app, but there mm. are many. Um, there is one in the city of Pittsburgh. It's called Walk Pittsburgh. Mm. And people log in their miles by community, and you can see how, you know, the carbon monoxide that has been saved and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's developing. Um, we don't presently have it. Can, can you tweet it? I think, at least my staff tells me you tweeted that, that the obesity problem in America, uh, if you follow the money, is more complex than tobacco. And, and so again, I want to ask you on this complexity issue whether or not we're missing some, some pathways to address that, that that we're not thinking about. Well, so yeah, it's more difficult because uh, you know, we haven't solved the smoking problem, but we've taken it from well over 50% to, to the low 20s, uh, largely because of we've taxed it, regulated it, uh, and uh, um, you know, had a lot of behavior change associated with it. You know, obesity is a, is a more complicated issue because it involves not only uh, what you eat and the composition of what you eat, but exercise and, and, mm. and, uh, and, and uh, physical activity. And the pathways to make those changes aren't just through one channel, which we had in, in tobacco, which was, was smoking. Mm -hmm. So it's a, more, it's a more complicated story. So I think if we're going to get to this, you've got to do, fundamentally uh, focus on a behavior change. Mm -hmm. And look at innovative ways to get the different audiences to make behavior change. So for example, um, I was really excited to see that Medicare is finally going to cover a program called the Diabetes Prevention Program, uh, a well-established diet, exercise, nutrition, lifestyle intervention, uh, focusing on pre-diabetic, uh, pre-hypertensive adults. It makes an enormous difference in slowing the progression to diabetes. We have half the Medicare population that's pre-diabetic. And the, the magic of it is in part because it's done in community-based settings. It's done in group settings. So people can that play. That sounds so earnest, though. When you look at what uh, Mike Bloomberg did by saying, oh, I'm going to ban sugary drinks or something, and, the, and he didn't succeed, but the awareness, when you think about awareness, um, Bloomberg, I mean, Emily Lenzner had her child you know, on sugary <laughs> drinks until the Mike Bloomberg fight, I'm sure, right, Emily? Uh, her son is a wonderful friend of mine, so I... I uh, uh, use him as a pawn in, in these conversations. But, but sometimes you just wonder, is there a way to generate awareness that's not Medicare or Medicaid or bureaucrat doing something earnest or not, but something that kind of shocks people a little bit more? Well, I think you've got to do it in multiple places. You have to do it in schools, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, in terms of uh, nutrition, uh, you know, just teaching the kids. Um, one, one of our big uh, uh, weapons is you teach a kid about healthy uh, food, nutrition, and so on, they bring that home. That makes a difference. You do it in communities, you do it at the workplace, mm. you use health plans. I mean, there's not going to be a single channel to get at this. You have to sort of take all the ammunition we have and make positive programs available. I, I think it's mm. harder to sort of tax and regulate our way out of this. I think you're going right. to have to fundamentally educate and provide people tools, whether it's innovation and fun, fun apps, uh, whether it's through providing uh, group settings to do something that's fun and do it sort of in a competitive way. There's a variety of ways that we're going to have to do this, and I would use all of those channels. Georges, what about the Lin-Manuel Miranda route, you know, wrapping towards public health? Is that something the American Public Health Association might put on the table? If it, if it makes people healthy and gets them to do the right thing, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll um, wrap our way to it. Wrap our way to it. Uh, let me just ask you just, you know, broadly, all of you, if you were to, you know, from, from mental health to violence in communities to just getting people out and walking and whatnot, which, which all of it sounds very good. And, and uh, 
Uh, there are a lot of other dimensions there. What do you think this town, you know, one of the, the challenges in Washington, D.C. is that the town is tied in knots right now at the federal level. A lot of communities are just doing what they want to do and not counting. But where, where do, would you like to see, what do you think we need to see a different federal response? Or should we just not count on that at all? Is it better just to leave Washington out of these questions? Carol? Yeah. George's, any, any, well, just go ahead. Eat. I, I go back to it's exactly a year ago um, this month that the Surgeon General issued a call to action, right. step it up. And in that call to action, you know, he called for walkable communities. He mm -hmm. said that inactivity is an epidemic. And it is. Um, so I, I actually think that the, I, I would like to see more momentum around that call to action. Mm -hmm. You see, he said inactivity. He also said yes. guns, very controversially, uh, uh, the Surgeon General, Murtha, and uh, uh, also did a public health campaign around vaccines. I did an interview with him with Elmo popped up out of a box behind us, mm -hmm. and we began talking about kids and vaccines. But do you think those kinds of things have any real impact when the Surgeon General says them? Um, I would like to think so. The truth is, is that WalkWorks was actually, um, had been initiated before the call to action. Hmm. So we've used it to just kind of reinforce our program. Ken, what would you like to see out of this town? Well, I think setting goals like that is, is important and sort of laying out the importance of, you know, going from X to Y and sort of setting a trajectory of, of where we should be. Uh, I think that's helpful, whether it's through Health, Healthy People 2020 or 2030 and, and uh, reports out of the Surgeon General's office. But fundamentally, we need to do this locally. Uh, and we need to have organizations that integrate all of the things we've been talking mm -hmm. about. You know, my concern is if we sort of do you know, a program here, a program there, and so on, we're not going to get the full benefit out of really having an integrated approach of, of leveraging all of these things that ultimately determine the health of populations. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I go back to my point that we need to take advantage of any organizing entity, whether it's the schools, the communities, the workplace, mm -hmm. health plans that can pull these things together and make them available and, and work with people to educate them on the utility of having uh, uh, you know, the use of these uh, services to do both prevention and exercise and diet and nutrition and so on. But bringing this stuff together, I think, is going to be a, a critical importance. Right. Otherwise, if it's just sort of siloed out there right. individually, we're just not going to get the potential maximum effect that we could get. Interesting. Before I go to the audience, Sheriff, I want to ask you a, an interesting question. I, I am increasingly struck by the fact that we have had so many people, but also particularly young men and can be in the front incarcerated and, and come out. And it's been controversial in Virginia because Terry McAuliffe uh, has just uh, created a pathway for former felons to vote, which I support because I think that helps people understand their, they can be stakeholders again. We have a lot of people that just had stuff happen in their lives. Um, as many of you may know, the company called Square, uh, Square is uh, chaired by now by Jack Dorsey, but a, um, a man named Jim McKelvey, uh, who was a glass artist among being a computer genius, created the company because he was trying to sell a piece of glassware to, to Brazil. And in that, he's developed his wealth and celebrities had to try to give people, teach people, older people, aged people, people who've had problems in their lives, how to code. His problem was getting human resource departments at firms to hire them because they didn't have the spotless resume. They didn't, and so a lot of people uh, have been branded by something. Can be a mental health issue, can be the branding in this society, the reputational side of anything going wrong uh, uh, has profound. So I'm just interested in how you think about, because second chances, a second chance infrastructure, and where prisons, do you agree, one, and two, do you think we need to think that through as part of our health strategy? Absolutely. And when you're talking about branding, um, even with uh, Medicaid in Virginia, once an individual gets locked up and they come to jail, all Medicaid um, benefits stop, suspended. Really? Really. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So For what um, kind of infractions? Doesn't matter. Interesting. Any. Okay. Um, but, right. Um, Just say this is a moment I learned something and did not know that. Is that I don't know if that's widely understood or known. Uh, anyway, don't didn't mean to interrupt you. It is with um, many of my uh, yeah. share friends. And, and you pick up the cost. We pick up the cost. Healthcare. That's right. Against transfer. Mm. That's that. absolutely right. Okay. Um, with um, branding, we um, have, I guess, two years ago started re-entry um, efforts to include 
resource fairs where mm -hmm. we bring in vendors from that have anything to do with housing, jobs, uh, probation and parole, even DMV Connect, because several of the folks that do end up getting locked up, they don't even have an identification card. Mm -hmm. So of course, when they get out of jail or prison, um, they can't get a job, they can't, they can't even go and check out a library book, believe it or not. So what we're doing is, because it, you are labeled as an ex-offender, we are trying to build on and to provide as many resources as we possibly can to help them go back into the community and be successful when they return. Um, also with um, programs to um, life skill programs. Mm. So we're doing a lot in terms of re-entry efforts and we're bringing in our community partners and I think what it's about um, for change to happen is everybody has to have a seat at the table. That's mm -hmm. what has to happen. You can no longer operate in a silo. Um, but I think when it comes to, to health, well-being, we all have a stake in this. Mm -hmm. So for somebody not to be valued and be a part of this, uh, that's definitely um, an initiative that we can, we can certainly do because it does take a village. So so happy to hear this is going on in Fairfax, I mean, to, to be and... honest. I mean, I'm really, really thrilled. We often like go far off and it's, it's interesting to hear about innovative things. Let me open up to the floor. Uh, yes, right over here. And we've got a microphone coming right over to you. Tell us who you are. Hope you're having a good time here today. Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. Beth Jacob, I'm the project director of We City... can't hear you. Is this mic no? not on, folks? Hello? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Beth Jacob, I'm the project director of City Health. We're a project of the De Beaumont Foundation looking at policy solutions to improve well-being and health in big cities. Um, and I have a question for the sheriff. You had mentioned um, in your earlier remarks about the importance of policy to support some of the initiatives mm. and efforts that you are undertaking. I'm wondering if you have any specific policy suggestions that you see as really helping to augment your work. Good question. Um, you know, we're, I've got a lot of suggestions, but in terms of focusing on um, specifics, we are in the, you know, obviously the beginning stages of what we're doing with Diversion First, although we've come quite a long way. And I don't think I really explained Diversion First, so if I may have a minute no, please, or two ahead, yes. to explain that. Diversion First, the purpose is to divert those individuals with mental illness into treatment as opposed to bringing them to jail. These are low risk offenders, pretty much nuisance crimes. Mm. And when they're diverted, they're diverted to a Maryfield Crisis Response Center where they are assessed. And if they are found to be eligible for diversion, um, they are um, transported to a local hospital by a deputy and a police officer if there's not a local a bed space available in that locality, which more so often is not, then we transport them down to another hospital somewhere within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and with this program, um, diverting folks, what we're finding is that, again, they're getting, they're getting help. Mm -hmm. um, in jail, when they come to jail, what, the best that we're able to offer is actually services, but it's not treatment. Um, and try to you know, sustain or get them to these individuals to an area where they are no longer in crisis. And that's a challenge, to say the very least. Can you least. share why you and a few colleagues spearheaded this program? Well, I can tell you that um, as a young deputy, I uh, was actually a college intern for the sheriff's office and graduated and came back to um, the sheriff's office to become a deputy sheriff. So for the 20 some years I'd worked the floors, um, I've seen firsthand what it's like to an experience and, and heard walking down a hallway where you've got individuals that are in cells that I, I would call solitary. The lights are on all night long and it was something that to me seemed like a psychiatric hospital. And it was, it wasn't, wasn't right. Mm. Um, screaming and just, you know, all, all day, all night. So this was extremely very important to me. Um, and of course, when I um, was elected sheriff, I got to make this happen, which was, you know, it's nice to be, have a seat at the table, but it's better to have it be at the head of the table. So, um, <laughs> But specifically with our diversion program, um, just quick numbers, since January 1st through uh, June of 2016, we have had 771 uh, individuals having contact with law enforcement that, are, that were experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, and then 291, I believe, of those individuals were able to be diverted into treatment as opposed to being brought to jail. 
So that's mm. pretty significant progress that we've made. Um, Terrific. Oh. Thank you. Yes, right up here in front, our, our, uh, our county man. Yes, sir. Roy. I would like to congratulate the sheriff for taking a proactive view towards the over-incarceration of mentally ill persons. The fact is that in most county jails, in most counties around this mm -hmm. nation, the county jail is the largest provider of mental health services in that county. Mm. And it's partially because it's easy, and it's partially because it's viewed as being cheaper. Mm. These community alternatives cost money to set up, but they save money in the long run. And lives. And lives and lives, and, and that's important. Jail is for people who are a danger mm. to society. Jail is not a place for your mental health to be restored. Thank so you. thank you for what you're doing. Great, thank you, Roy. Uh, in the very back, this gentleman in the last row. Uh, yeah. We're gonna do lightning round here. And any questions for the rest of the panel is good, too. Or good, too. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Hi, this is for any of the panelists. I'm Cannon Lovell with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS. Yes. Um, I would propose that governmental public health has a really important role to play in impacting the social determinants, yet Ken pointed out the real disparity between healthcare spending and public health spending. So how do we reconcile that, and how do we get public health to the head of the table? Thank you. Great question. Well, what I, I'll give you a specific example of, of uh, something that we could do, and it's really based on work I've done in Vermont with their community health teams. Uh, if we allowed uh, our health plans, let's say, in a Medicare Advantage program, to bring in social service uh, uh, services, uh, to provide that as a covered benefit, uh, to bring in home and community support services as part of their overall toolkit of taking care of patients, I think that that would be an important start because you know, we're talking about behavioral health issues. Uh, if you look at people with a behavioral health issue, 80% of them have four or more additional chronic comorbid conditions. And these are complicated patients that require a much broader toolkit mm -hmm. of interventions and services to work with them. So I, I would start with there to give these plans uh, the flexibility to, to pull in and integrate all of these one-off and standalone services to have it as an overall game plan mm -hmm. for working with and managing patients. Thank you. Well, this, well, well, the other thing you can do is also strengthen your state and local health departments so they can work with those and, plans and, as and well. Work and collaborate with, the, <coughs> yeah. with public health. Uh, the public they health can bring nurses, the social services too. Public health nurses were a big part of what those uh, community health teams did and is one of the reasons why they were very successful. Right, great. So we're going to finish lightning round right mm -hmm. near the end, right here, yes. Uh, Loren uh, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, uh, Assistant Dean of Student Affairs, uh, George Washington University School of Medicine. Good to have and you. And thank you so very much. Um, I wanted to just, before I even ask my question, I wanted to sincerely thank um, the sheriff for everything that she's doing in uh, Fairfax County. I'm a psychiatrist. Okay, no more thanks. We've thanked yes. her enough. Yeah, she's, <laughs> well, she's, she gets that. I'm a psychiatrist. Very impressive. All right. All right, question. Uh, my question is simply this. Um, recent reports have come out uh, from the CDC that the rates of suicide increased by 24% over the past 10 years. Uh, rates of cancer in a 10-year period, all combined cancer deaths have decreased by 23%. My question to the panel is simply this. When are we going to have a serious discussion about the over 24% increase in suicide rates in this country, predominantly in white men and white females. Thank you. And this gentleman right behind you, we're going to take your question now and then wrap it all up here. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jack Rayburn, Trust for America's Health. I just wanted to reiterate the previous question is just, just focusing specifically on governmental public health. And Dr. Thorpe talked, you know, starting the discussion about the, the extreme mismatch in investments. And what are we going to do about that problem? So government, public health, mismatch. So we're going to just go down the line. So um, I'm going to start with the, the sheriff on, on suicide versus cancer. But like, we're, we're, all this is really about is, is priorities. How do, you, how do you, what do you, from your various vantage points, think is doable in terms of shifting social and political priorities and, and 30 seconds or less? I think it's engagement. I think it's you go out, you meet with people, you walk the walk, you talk the talk, and you bring people on board. And what matters to one person may not matter to another person, but you sell it and you market it, mm. and it will matter to that person. That's great. Carol? 
I think we need to start talking and, and educating and working with the elderly, with the older adults as well, because that's where we're seeing suicides as well. Mm. Kenneth? Well, I think it's education, but I think it's leadership. Uh, to somebody to take, uh, uh, take action, uh, whether it's at the community level, at uh, school, uh, workplace level, health plan level, and really recognize that we have a lot of effective programs out there, but we need the leadership to find tools to leverage and pull them together. Georges? So both at the federal, state, and local level, we just spent the last eight years doing health care insurance reform, spending the next eight years doing public health reform. Wow. I just thank you. It's been a fun conversation, interesting, and went ways I didn't ex expect. I am fascinated uh, by all of your work, but I'm also particularly fascinated by what you're doing in Fairfax. I would like to tell those people that are asking about the government issues and sort of big leadership questions. I, I had an uh, opportunity two years ago to go rifle around the archives of the Rockefeller Foundation up in Poconico, uh, New York. And this is, this is John D. Rockefeller. They were set up originally to basically promote public health, not only in the, in the United States and dealing with ring, ringworm, but, but internationally. And really a lot of the public health programs that were set up were set up by this large foundation. A lot of it had to deal with you know, extending health practices and disciplines. And you just wonder whether or not we need something else like that again, whether it's the Surgeon General Plus, whether it's the government that we're kind of going on autopilot and inertia, but you need to have a new awakening. And I think that may be part of what programs like this are about is a new awakening. And I really appreciate all of you for sharing you know, your definition and how you been, begin thinking about a more holistic program in health. So please thank Georges Benjamin, Kenneth Thorpe, Carol Richbaum, and Sheriff Stacy Kincaid. Thank you so much. Really great program. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Carol. Thank you.